Welcome to a conversation on how to make your questions essential. I'm Deb Rogge, Professional Development Coordinator at ESU 8 in Neely, Nebraska, and I will be leading you through this conversation. Um, the work that I'm going to be sharing with you today is the research of Grant Wiggins and Denise Wilbur, and I'd like to start with a quote from their work. Quote, the well-known aphorism that quote, writing is revision, unquote, applies particularly well to crafting essential questions. With more than 30 years' experience in teaching through questions and helping educators create great unit framing queries, we've repeatedly seen the wisdom of this saying. A, def a quick definition of revision in writing is um, taking out and putting in whatever makes the writing piece that you have stronger and have better purpose and better meaning and better relationship to the reader. So that applies very well with essential questions. Um, before we go much further, I really believe we need to have a definition of what makes a question essential. Um, as it says here on the slide, essential questions fo foster the kinds of inquiries, discussions, and reflections that help learners find meaning in their learning, achieve deeper thought in their uh, processes, and better quality within their work. There are eight criteria for uh, essential questions. Those criteria are to stimulate ongoing thinking and inquiry. They are arguable with multiple plausible answers. They raise further questions. They spark discussion and debate. They demand evidence and reasoning because of varying answers exist. They point to big ideas and pressing issues. They are fruitfully uh, recurring throughout the unit or the year. And the answers proposed are tentative and may change in light of new experiences and deeper understanding. Uh, these are four examples of good essential questions. And uh, what makes them good essential questions is that they meet all of the criteria that I just shared with you. They are all convergent uh, in their, their low-level question design. Oh, I told you the wrong thing. I'm sorry. Um, I did not tell you the wrong thing because these are examples of good essential questions. Let me read them to you. To what extent does where you live influence how you live? What should we make of outliers, errors, anomaly, or insight? What should our diet and wellness plans be in a world of constantly changing advice from experts? Now, these are common first draft questions that you might have. And as I read through these questions, I saw myself uh, writing these questions just as well as any other instructor might that's not as uh, skilled in the writing of essential questions. Those questions are how do good readers use strategies to understand text? What's the value of chemistry? Uh, what were the three major causes of World War I, and why do earthquakes happen? Now, these questions failed to meet the uh, suggested criteria I shared with you earlier. They're all convergent, low-level questions designed to support content acquisition. They either point towards the one official right answer, or they elicit uh, mere lists and and there are no other further inquiries that are necessary uh, from the student to provide to the teacher or the teacher to provide to the student. Now, <clears throat> what we're seeing here might be uh, 
essentially first drafts. And it's, um, it's, it's first drafts of essential questions, which are likely to be too focused, uh, fact-focused. And uh, we need to assure that sub subsequent uh, drafts better meet the criteria that we, the criteria shared. Now, in order to do, make sure that our questions uh, meet the eight criteria, Wiggins and Wilbur have uh, seven ways to hone your question. The first way is how well does the draft question meet the criteria? Now, let's go back out here. Remember, these are our uh, essential question criteria, all those eight that I shared with you. And um, they say that writers of essential questions need to develop the discipline of pausing or of setting aside or of just uh, not completing at one time or to, in order to deliberately assess their questions against uh, specific Writers of essential questions need to develop the discipline of pausing to deliberately self-assess their questions against specific criteria. In this case, the eight criteria I shared with you earlier. I'm going to show you an example, a non-example of, a, of a, an essential question. It's how do good readers use strategies to understand text? The question is leading. It merely aims to remind students of the question, and it asks for recall, not inquiry. Now here is an example written of the non-example using the essential question criteria. By putting the question in this manner, uh, the student must think about all the possible moves and determine which to use in you know, each stuck situation that they, they become into. Um, with each of the seven ways to hone your questions, they, Wiggins and Wilbur also offer some tips. Now the tips are going to be at the bottom of each of the seven ways. Now you can have access to the tips and uh, any of the resources that I share by downloading the PowerPoint, which is also available uh, to you at the uh, ESU uh, Wednesday web webinar website. Now, the tip here for the first way is how does it meet? How well does it meet the criteria? Is that um, if you have students generalize their answers, it helps them to become self-regulated learners because the generalizations that they draw facilitate transfer. You want them to transfer this. For instance, the strategies they would use. What strategies do you use to read um, science material? What strategies for social studies material? What strategies do you use for reading any research or an article? All of those kinds of things. So you want them to transfer what they know and are able to do. The second uh, way to hone your questions is is to uh, is outlined here. It's as if the question is too divergent or too convergent, and that means it's too similar in its characteristics. How can I phrase it to invite inquiry and argument? If the question is factual, what question on the same topic is worth arguing about? Now, we typically find debates not in the content itself, but in the discussions of its value, its importance, and its applicability. Now, I'm going to take a sports uh, view on this, and I'm going to give you an example using uh, soccer, for instance, it says that um, there's no argument about how to kick a soccer ball with the instep of your foot, but there are endless, endless debates about when to shoot, when to pass, and or when to dribble. The non-example that I have for you uh, on this inviting inquiry is this question right here. 
what is proper proper punctuation and why is it so important now I think you have to agree with me that there's little argument about the first half of the question and that the second half seems to limit rather than to expand the inquiry let's look Let's look at uh, the example when it's written as an essential question. When is it proper punctuation mandatory? And when is it optional? That really opens it up. It invites inquiry and argument. It actually asks you, what are the facts about how, when is it mandatory and when is it optional? It's, it gives it more depth and more body, more realism. The, tip that they give here is that you rephrase a draft question um, using sentence stems and there are some sentence stems which are below here. Uh, I want to share with you um, a t-chart for your questions. For, uh, the non-example was a factual question and the example was an essential question. So what I've done here with this t-chart is that I have used what we teach uh, about Columbus and his uh, exploration of the Americas and uh, I've written down my fact questions and the first one there is name Columbus's three ships and the second one is why did this crew consider mutiny? Well I transform them into essential questions so that they meet the eight in, uh, criteria or many or most of the eight criteria. Now from name Columbus three Columbus's three ships, I've uh, rewritten that question in this manner: How important was it Columbus's expedition be made up of three ships? Now, it uh, it gets into the um, the naming of the ships because each one of those ships had a different function, and there were different uh, reasons that the ships came along and and. It allows students to dig deeper into it, into their thoughts, into their beliefs, into the research, into the actual historical documents that talk talk about why it was important that there be three ships on this on this uh, expedition. Now, when we consider why did the crew consider mutiny, well, that isn't a can be more of an opinion. It 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 can't. It it may have some facts to it, but it's just a listing of everything. If we take the essential question written to that, it says, "What were some of the motives behind Columbus's crew to mutiny?" When we talk about the motives rather than why they did it, we already know that they they were considering it. But what were the motives? And that'll cause again some inquiry, it causes them to have some arguments about what was happening or what wasn't happening within the crew and all of those uh, opportunities. Now, if you notice down in the lower left hand corner, I have a link there and again, uh, that link will give you, uh, lead you to a PowerPoint that has uh, more STEM question uh, lead-ins, more resources for you. Again, remember, uh, if you download the PowerPoint, you have access to all of my um, resources. Now we need to consider the third way to hone your essential questions. This says, is the question merely engaging or will pursuing it lead you to the topic's big idea? Does it simply grab you or will it lead you to the big idea? You know, to engage students, some teachers frame an essential question that goes off onto on a tangent. And um, that might be that they might do something. It really doesn't connect to the learning that they want to have or the objective that they want to want to uh, accomplish for the day. It's merely something that's fun, something that might reach the students, but it doesn't help them connect to the learning. Um, but a good question has to be more than just intriguing. The best essential questions are uh, literally of the essence, of the essence of the big idea. They take you to the core issues and the insights of the topic. Now let's look at a couple of non-examples. Um, I have a science and I have a math. 
and the science one has to do with crustaceans. If you don't remember what crustaceans are, crustaceans are um, uh, like lobsters and crabs and uh, those types of sea animals. And look here at the question that goes off of a tangent is the first example that says, well, what's up with them? Well, if the students know what a crustacean is and what's up with them, it, it really it doesn't ask you ask them to get to the, the big idea or the objective for the day to even start thinking about that. And then the other question that's asked there, what is a good bug? I it you know, have you really talked about the idea that crustaceans are actually part of the insect family? It, 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 how does that get to the big idea? It, it actually makes students um, think in other ways because we really haven't talked a whole lot about the idea that lobsters and crabs, crabs and so on are crustaceans, uh, that they are bugs. Um, they only take the core issues in the insights of the topic. They don't take anything else. Um, when we consider the math question, where do we find examples of blah in the real world? Um, not only it doesn't get to the core issues, the insights of the topic. Um, actually, this is a geometry question. And uh, when we're talking about shapes in the real world, um, it just asks for a listing of where they are. So if you take it to an example of an essential question, in, you, it reads like this, how much and in what ways would we most miss similar figures if they didn't exist? In other words, what impact would it have upon us? What... Um, what might be what might be happening? What might not be happening? What might have been invented? What might have been used? What might have not have been used? It just offers and opens it so much wider so that you can actually lead to the big idea or the objective of the day. It's an intriguing and it's an argumentable uh, question. It also goes deep into math and it opens up an exploration of other geometries just beside Lucidity. Uh, Euclidean uh, geometry. And the way that uh, the tip that they offer here is using concept maps. Now I don't know if you've ever used concept maps. Maybe you've had your students use concept maps, but have you ever used concept maps in order to formulate your question? You know, concept maps sometimes are called mind maps. And they're very pop, uh, powerful because they make your questions uh, more pointed to the objectives that you've uh, or the big ideas that you've identified. Um, this is a suggestion of a mind map of a mind map or a concept map of a concept map. You have uh, how you create a concept map is the concept that we're working with and the first ring around the outside or the first bubble of each color are the uh, concepts that you want to uh, bring home or you want to, objectives that you want your students to be able to know and be able to do. And then uh, stemming from each of those knows and do's are the various activities or the various uh, learnings that you want them to have about, about the uh, main uh, concept that you're you're trying to teach your students. Many times as teachers we create these concept or mind maps in our mind, but as we're practicing and honing the creation and the implementation of essential questions with our students, we need to take the time to map out or actually create the map. Uh, practice, practice, practice. It's very, very important. Uh, idea four to hone your questioning, essential questions creation is, is the question general enough to use across other units or is it bound too narrowly to just this topic? Now this really speaks to that, is what they're learning here 
applicable to what they're learning there. The, the best example that I can think of right here, it, it, and, and I've experienced it myself, and I know you have too, the students write a research paper in English class. The students write a research paper or a question paper in social studies or science. Now, they have to transfer their English skills, their, their English writing skills, all of those uh, domains that had to be a part of that in order to be deemed as successful as a writing piece. And they, they don't, students don't always transfer what they learned in English to what they're going to uh, write and do in a, a structure in either the social studies or the science research paper. Everything has to be able to be moved across. What we learn in mathematics about uh, the use of equations, we also need to be able to transfer that knowledge into chemistry and physics so that we can, it, it, all, it makes sense. You don't want it too narrow so that it only applies here. You want everything to work together. Now, for instance, uh, the examples I gave you before were just a little bit more far-fetched, but if you can focus on this in literature, here we have this question, which is a factual question of how do frog and toad act like friends? And then the social studies question, why did we fight in Vietnam and was it worth it? Now, let's look at the examples that are written in essential question style. The literature question has been transposed into this. Who is a true friend? And the social studies question into why have we gone to war? When was it wise? And when was it foolish? By revising the questions, particularly let's look at the literature question, to who is a true friend, we can connect to very texts and to our own personal experience. In addition to making us question the question, what do we mean by true friend? This revised query recurs over and over and over again throughout our lives. What do we mean by a true friend? You know, we find this in history, we find this in psychology, as well as in literacy. Who is a true friend? But when we look, and when we look at the social studies two questions, it sets a more helpful agenda for um, a history course. Why have we gone to war? When was it wise? When was it foolish? We, we have a tendency to want to study things in silos or in isolation. How can we bring all of that learning together so that we can learn the lessons of why we have gone to war, when was it wise, and when was it foolish. The tips that uh, Wiggins and Wilbur offer to us right here is avoid mentioning or entering out specific topic in the question. Keep it pretty general. Don't be specific about books or, or events or anything. Um, Make those questions overarching. In other words, and then you can underneath, like when you're doing your, um, your concept map, your mind map, you can get to those, specifically to the Vietnam War and was it worth it. But what are the overarching, overarching? Um, <clears throat> now we're going to move on to... Uh, what is the essential, fifth essential way to hone your questions? Here it says, does the question get at what's odd, counterintuitive, or easily misunderstood? Or is it a predictable question with mundane and relatively superficial answers? Let's talk a little bit about what's odd, counterintuitive, or easily misunderstood. There are common mis- interpretations or misconceptions are a rich uh, resource for, um, for such questions. When we look at our non-examples, here they have, uh, they're, they're pretty flat. They don't have any robust 
to them. It says, what's the difference between fiction and nonfiction? A simple key chart would satisfy the answer there. And what's a theory in science? That's a definition. What is history? That's a definition. And what can numbers help us do? That's a listing again there. So if we translate those into essential questions, the fiction, nonfiction question comes, when is fiction revealing and when is it a lie? Interesting, huh? Let's talk about the theory in science. If we can't see something, gravity, human evolution, dinosaurs, and so on, how do we know it is or was there? Interesting proposal. When considering the history question, if history is the story told by the winners, what stories aren't we hearing? Nice twist, isn't it? There are a lot of things that happen in history that were only told the winner's side. What happened to those that were the losers? And the last question about numbers. Why can't the language of numbers communicate? I said that wrong. It should be what can't the language of numer numbers communicate? Why ask for a listing? What asks for a thinking? So it's important that that question be, what can't the language of numbers communicate? You need to familiarize yourself in the tip it says with the most counterintuitive and most commonly under, misunderstood aspects of the subject or the subjects that you teach. Now, what I have done here is I went out to Google and I put in the, the search just common student misconceptions. You can refine this all the way down. They will give you just all kinds of answers on this. But look where the orange arrow is. Um, in 5.3 seconds, I got 10,200,000 results about common student misconceptions. We need to know what they have wrong in their brain so we can help them get it fixed in their understanding, in their depth of knowledge, and their application. Not so much fixed as to get it more solid, to get it, it, get them on the right track so that they don't have those misconceptions. So please consider researching the common student misconceptions of your subject or of what you're about to teach. You need to build your questions around those misconceptions so you can clear them up so students can continue with their learning. The sixth way to hone your essential questions is to ask this question. Am I trying too hard to craft the perfect question? It's very, very simple uh, that we have the, the, don't try to write the one ideal question on the first try. Don't spend too much time wordsmithing the question. These are the golden nuggets of this particular slide. We often see question writers trying to create the uh, one ideal question on the first try. We want numerous and diverse areas. We often see question writers trying to create the one ideal question on the first try. We want numerous and diverse ideas at first, jotted down quickly from which one will emerge. That's where that T-chart comes in. Jot down the factuals that you want. The problem is compounded when writers spend too much time wordsmithing that question instead of trying to generate the best intellectual direction that you want that question to take your students as to the big ideas or the objective of the day. Don't try to write and edit simultaneously. Um, draft a bunch of questions first, then edit. The more versions you draft, the easier the edit editing will be. I did that with my T-chart on Columbus. I wrote down those two facts first. Then I came back and I started with one of the question stems, and that's where I made my decision 
on how, what direction that question was going to take or how I was going to move that into an essential question using the eight criteria. Here we go. Ask yourself, what am I trying to say? To whom am I trying to say it? What do I want, want my readers to leave with or be ready to do after reading this? Maybe you use all the questions, maybe you won't. Don't be disappointed if you don't. It's all part of teaching our students and reaching our students so that they truly are um, using all of their skills, not just their rote skills, all of their skills in their learning. The seventh and the last way to hone your uh, questions is to look at this question. Am I looking for questions in all the wrong places? Seems pretty simple. Sounds almost like a country song, doesn't it? But this quote from the research of Wiggins and Wilbur really is important. Essential questions are a design move intended to make it more likely that the work in the talk gets beyond low-level coverage. We want to move up Bloom's taxonomy. We want to move uh, further around in any of those taxonomies. We want to get to the higher levels of thinking, doing, and being. By committing to essential questions as a framing approach, you know, you're planning for inquiry and argument as a priority outcome. Essential questions aren't a teaching move. They are an inquiry and an argument uh, planning for. And in other words, it's stimulation. It's moving it forward. So you want to make sure to aim for understanding is, as this this comes to, it says, is to aim for three kinds of learning. You want acquisition, you want meaning making, and you want transfer. So in order to get acquisition, meaning making, and transfer, you have to build them into your lessons. You have to use various forms or other forms other than just teacher-student interaction. Um, I have gone out and uh, collected some resources for you on a Socratic uh, seminar. So you see there's a definition and a strategy there. There's also a YouTube that shows it in action. I have, uh, you want to consider using formal debate. Um, there's a brief introduction for the beginners and a student handout. Now remember, debate isn't only for speech. It isn't only for the debate team. Debate, it, it can be as formal or informal as you want it to be. But remember that in debate, you are able to support your positions with more than just feeling or feeling tone. And the last uh, is problem-based learning. Um, here's a study guide and a strategies for that. And also, I've included a YouTube here. Uh, on uh, what problem-based learning actually is to help you get a, a better picture and a better view of that. Well, there's a bottom line to essential questioning. You have to get in the habit of always critiquing the essential questions that you draft. They're not done the first time. Look at them again, look at them again. Remember the T format. That will help you very much. We need to remember that high-level inquiries and questioning yield some of the greatest gains for our students as well as better engagement. You know, that happens. It, this statement also talks about conventional tests. It's, it can be both formative and summative tests that you give of their achievement. They'll do better on their chapter tests, on their quizzes, on um, their L to J, if you're using that particular strategy of uh, testing achievement, um, on your norm reference tests, such as MAP or ACT, or as the COMPASS test, all of those types of tests. 
you will get the greatest gains if you as a teacher are helping your students dig deeper into their knowing and doing by using essential questions. And above all, remember, getting the question right takes discipline, skill, and artfulness. Practice, practice, practice. But this is the biggest nugget I can give to you. It's well worth the effort to ensure that students tackle inquiries that are important, intriguing, and revealing. Decide what the essential learnings are. Decide what the essential questions have to be about those essential learnings. What are the targets? What are the objectives? What are the big ideas? Ensure that they tackle those inquiries. Ensure that. Well, I thank you for being with me for this uh, conversation on essential questions. I invite you again and remind you that the PowerPoint is also available to you um, at the Wednesday webinar site. Uh, again, in, if you download the PowerPoint, you will have uh, direct clickable access to all of the uh, additional materials that I uh, found and would love to share with you. Thank you.